Today, it's good to have you in the church, by the way. Glad you're here. Um, this morning, you know, I, I, was, I thought I was going to continue with the sermon that I did before Easter and Palm Sunday where it was living selfless in a selfie world. And I tried. I, I really, I mean, I gave myself a headache trying so much. And, and um, we're not, we're done. That's, that series is done for now. <laughs> I, 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 so I got a new one. Um, and it might be, well, it'll go longer than today. But, um, sorry, I got the light shining on me. Today's title is this. You're different now. You're different now. One of the most used tools in the devil's toolbox. I had a, I don't know if it was the Rev back in the day or a, a youth evangelist one time. I, I heard them talk about the devil has a toolbox. And coming from a construction background, toolbox really struck home with me. You don't put tools in your toolbox that you don't use. A well-used tool is in your toolbox. It's something that you need. The devil has a toolbox. And one of the most used tools by the devil that I see, especially today, is the one called doubt. D-O-U-B-T. Doubt. The definition of doubt is this. Uncertainty, confusion, and hesitation. In my opinion today, in Christians' lives... Doubt is one of the most used tools by the enemy. Doubt will bring uncertainty into your walk with Christ. Doubt will bring confusion in your walk with Christ. And doubt will definitely bring hesitation in your walk with Christ. And I see right there in just those three words how that part can just branch off into a whole other part of this sermon... And that very might be where we go. But the how. How does the enemy use this tool? The enemy uses this tool, how he uses it is to constantly remind us of our past life before Jesus Christ. And he uses it to cast doubt on whether or not we, and hear me, whether or not we really are different. I remember I, I took a, well, when I was in college, I took a class. Um, volleyball and badminton. Scuba diving. Canoeing and sailing. Aquatics. All taught by my college swim coach. But there was another course I took in business law, which talks about, I remember a segment where it talks about new products and how you can advertise new products. And do you realize that, I, and I don't quote me because it's been a long time, but when you put the word new on it, it can only be on for a certain period of time and then it's no longer new. I don't remember if it's six months, a year, whatever it is. But then something has to change so it's new. And what they simply can change is the box. They can change how the box opens versus how if it opened from the right to left, now it can open from the left to the right. That's new. New and improved. But the thing about what's inside the box, that hasn't changed at all. The devil quite often will constantly remind us of our past life and will cast doubt on whether or not we are really different on the inside. We might be on the outside, new creations in Christ. We prayed the prayer. We, 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 we're, we're doing all the right things. But are we really, are we for sure inside really a different person? The devil will cast doubt. That's how he uses doubt. The why. This tactic works because we have a tendency... To store up all the memories of our past. And all that is needed is cast doubt. 
so that in an instant, we revert right back to our past life, our past thoughts, and our past actions. It brings us to the place where we, hear me, once were. So when the devil casts doubt, this is the, the, this is the why. He'll cast doubt, and all of a sudden, you'll begin to hear that whisper that you are no longer that new person. You are just really that old person with a new skin on. But let me make this quite clear to you so I don't forget. God is in the business of redesigning your insides. He's in the business of changing who you are. Yet the devil will remind you who you once were. The result is this. We end up doubting our salvation. We end up doubting our new life. We end up doubting our relationship in Jesus Christ. And don't just think that happens to us non-church people. You know, those of us that came into the fold later on in life and we accepted Christ. And of course, we have this past. I see church people, people who have been raised in the church, often have a bigger struggle than us heathen people because of the fact they were more involved in church and religion than they were in relationship. Now, how can we overcome this? How can we overcome? And I'm not just saying this, but God's word saying this. We can't overcome this. There's the hope. You got me? We got to look at this stuff. We got to clear some stuff out inside. And then we look at how God, how we can change, how God changes things. Here's a little note. How we overcome this is simple. It's not simple. It's, it's tough. It's this. It takes being proactive and aggressive with our faith in God's word. Okay. I, normally preachers have a Bible up here. I write my scripture on my holy yellow legal pad because I write them big enough I can see them. Okay, if I had a Bible up here that was big enough I could see, I'd be flipping the page for every word. Okay, so you know, you know what I'm saying? So, but the thing about God's word is this. It never changes. It never changes. What we have to do as individuals, as individuals, you see, the body of the firehouse or the body of any other church is made up of individuals. And you are part of the firehouse, but the firehouse is, is made up of individuals. Every one of us as individuals, not just of the firehouse, but as individuals in Jesus Christ, we have to aggressively, aggressively understand and connect with the word of God. There's no question in that. There is a huge importance in that. And let me say this to you. And I've said it before. I'm hoping to say it a little differently to make a little better sense. People in church look at the pastor as the one to feed them. People have said to me and other pastors, I'm not being fed pastor by you. The church isn't feeding me. Therefore, I need to go somewhere where I am fed. The Apostle Paul talks about when you're a newborn, you are fed by the bottle or by the breast. My wife was Meals on Wheels when she had our kids. In the, old, in the, in the Bible times, they didn't have bottles. They had mothers who had babies that nursed off of them. Or if the mother's milk was not uh, strong enough or good enough, they had what they call wet nurses. I don't know if they still have wet nurses today. Gina, do they still have wet nurses? Third world countries, but like here, we're like, oh, no. <laughs> they do have donor milk. Really? Like you can sell it? Black market B -b milk? <sighs> All right, somebody need to take one for the team here. <laughs> yeah. So a wet nurse, for example, is a lady who's had a baby 
and yet her child is old enough, but she continues to nurse, and as you continue to nurse, you'll continue to produce milk. So Apostle Paul says, when you were infants, you desired milk. I remember after, I don't remember how long Chira nursed the kids, but they were all different, and then you got sick with Alexis. But the fact is, at a certain point, you stop. Because then they got teeth. That's not a good thing. Teeth are designed for something. They're designed to chew and to bite and to chomp on things. So you start giving the kid, like, food. And in the beginning, uh, you know, they're wearing more than, they, the, the, than they're getting in. They're, they're smeared on it all over there. So it's pureed, but it's, you know, you're just shoveling it in there. You know, they got the gag response. But eventually, that gag response goes away, and then they start to use their hands, and they're just, you know, try to stop a kid from eating a handful of Cheerios. I, I, just go ahead and try. Try to stop a kid from just shoveling it in. Good luck with that. Then, you start, then they start to use a spoon. And then they, they're missing, you know, and they're hitting the, your ear, and you've got to just hose them down and all that kind of stuff. And then it continues and continues. And before you know it, they're using a fork, and then they're using a knife. And they're not coming up to you anymore saying, hey, would you, would you feed me? Because it's all designed for you to learn to feed yourself. And let me make this clear so we have an understanding. No pastor and no church is supposed to feed you as you mature in Christ. I don't look to her and say, feed me. I usually say, get out of the way, I'm hungry. I'll eat whatever's, whatever I can. It's the same way, folks. And in this day and age, we're seeing more and more of a dependency on the, on, on, on the institution of the church. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't say, well, he just gave me a ticket to get out a church free card. Why do I need to? I was only coming to the church for the message. Now, messages do enhance your growth, encourage your growth. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important part of all of our growth. But it's not the end thing. Coming together in worship. Being eye to eye. We were talking, for example, on the men's missions trip, we were talking about different things with church and stuff. And one of the things now is you live stream church. Which, and, I, and I'm not into the technology stuff. I mean... But live streaming or, or people say, well, I stay home and I, I now watch it on live stream. They watch churches in other states because they like the church, which, okay. And, and they're starting, but you know, this is me, what I, what I, what's disturbing to me. Like if you're home, you're laid up, and, and you can't get to church, you watch, a, you watch a service. I think that's a wonderful way, but it's a double-edged sword. Because what else can start to happen You'll just decide to get in your chair, in your skivvies, and sit there with a cup of coffee and watch the service and get up and go, well, that was nice. But you know what you've missed? Eye to eye. Contact to contact. A place where the Bible says, do not forsake the meeting together. Because the reason why they say do not forsake the meeting together, it's important that we see each other. It's important that we look at each other and say, how are you doing? Are you okay? How can I pray for you? Coming together to worship is important. It's important. So these are things that we, we, we have to begin to reestablish in our life. I see it being torn away more and more. But the word of God has to be firmly and aggressively sought out in our lives. God wrote his word down so it can never be changed. God's word doesn't need to change. That's why in today's world it is so offensive to people. It is so offensive to people. Well, we just watched God's Not Dead 2 the other night. I, I guess there's now a third one. We're, we're a little behind. But one of the things that they talk about is, and people think it was just in the movies, is where pastors of churches 
will eventually have to turn their sermons into the government officials for the government officials to look at the sermons that are preached so that they can see if they are offensive or not. Let me tell you right now, you can come visit me in jail because that ain't happening. But the word of God has become so offensive and that's why man wants it to change. But the fact of the matter is God wrote it down because he knows it shouldn't change. We have to change. Now, the message title is this. You're different now. <clears throat> Here's where, don't worry, I've already quoted some scripture, but I'll be getting to it. But I, it's the, you know, back story that you need to hear. Here's where feelings and faith collide. Here's where feelings and faith collide. Don't put your hands up. How many of you have ever said, I don't feel different. I don't feel different. I prayed. I, I don't feel different. I thought there would be like lightning bolts and stars and angels. and I don't feel different. That only happens when you get electrocuted. Okay? Here is where doubt begins to gain strength. When you say... I don't feel different. You can and will feel different as you become more determined to stand upon the promises of God. Let me read that to you again. You can and will feel different as you become more determined to stand upon the promises of God. Because you're feeling operation turns into a faith operation where all of a sudden you're no longer just waiting for yourself to feel it you have faith to believe it there's a difference there it's like when you get married you may not always feel like you want to be married that day but you, ha you have a commitment, so you get beyond that feeling. Maybe you had an argument. We've had arguments where you, we look at each other like, oh, you're not the favorite person in my life right now. And we've, because we're older now, we do make truces that we will sleep and go in the same bed and pick it up tomorrow morning first thing. But if you based it on that, well, we would have called it a day a long time ago. But no, we got faith. We got faith in each other and we got faith in God and we know we're going to get through it. See, this is where the whole feeling and faith thing has to be looked at. Now, Paul talks about this. Turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. I'm going to read part of the passage to you and then I'm going to explain a few things to you. So, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. It reads as this, 9 and 10. Now, uh, here is where Paul gives what I call the short list of those who will not, and this is what it says, those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. I've seen pastors on YouTube and stuff and on shows asked who goes to heaven, and they've said that's up to God. Well, it is up to God. Read his book, and it'll tell you who will and who will not. So the short list is basically this, when he says, don't be deceived, sexually immoral, adulterers with an I, adulterers with an A, male prostitute, homosexual offenders, thieves, greedy, drunkenness, slanderous, and swindlers. Talk about being all over the map. He went from over here, the sexual things, to over here, just you being a swindler. Now, again, that's the short list because throughout Scripture, throughout the New Testament, they list the different things that are the fruit of the Spirit and also the lust of the flesh. But what's, what's so important is verse number 11, and this is where we're going to focus on. It says this, and that is what some of you were, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Here Paul, and believe me, I had to look this one up because I took English as a foreign language. Here Paul uses the past tense. Were. W-E-R-E. Almost like Paul's going to do a little history lesson here. You were something... And hear me, in which you're not now. Get a hold of that. Hear what he says? Well, I, I read the scripture, but that's, this is the meaning behind what he says. You were once something. But that something that you were, you no longer are. You're now different. God's word is declaring that there is now a difference. Christ has been invited into your life, so therefore you're different now. But Pastor Steve, I'm telling you, I'm sitting here and I feel zero difference. Zero. I'm still the same I was, I'm just here. I don't think there's a single one of us that have ever sat in a church service, if we're really honest with ourselves, that didn't feel that way. We are mortal beings. We fail. We fail. Now, scripture calls us, and we'll go through the three things that he said, but calls us out of our old life, calls us out, and that sometimes means you're not just, you, you, you got to fight for it. Because your old life is just standing there looking all nice to you again. But if you remember how miserable you were in your old life, you, and that's why you got the new life, why would you want to go back to the old life again? All of this is subject to our, and hear me, our desire to live for him. If we have a desire to live for him. Do we have a desire to live for him? 1 Corinthians was written by Paul because he had to write the Corinthian church because what he needed to do is he needed to strengthen the believers who were in Christ Jesus. He needed to put an end to their immaturity of their faith. So Paul wrote letters to Galatians Thessalonians and Philippians and Colossians and Corinthians and he, and he wrote letters to Timothy. He wrote, there, there, there's, there's letters that he wrote. He wrote to these churches. The Corinthian church was a very strong, quickly developing church. But one of the things were they had a problem. Their problem was they were very talented. And they had a lot of opportunity, but they were lacking in true spiritual change. Because people were continuing to live like they did before Christ. There was sexual immorality going on in the Corinthian church. There was false teaching going on in the Corinthian church. Things that should have set off all the bells and whistles and the alarms should have all went off, but the Corinthian church just continued on because... They were not mature in the things of God. They weren't looking for a change. They were just looking to be called Christian. And Paul says, you know what? I, I got to take care of this. In fact, when Paul writes that, those few verses ahead of what I just read to you, he was writing about believers taking other believers to court, basically. He says, you guys don't do that. You work it out. He says, you don't do things like the way the world does. But then he goes on to say, here's what you were, but here's now that you're different. People were not living spiritually changed. Are you living spiritually changed? Even if you don't feel like it. Well, I read the Bible and nothing happens. Welcome to the world. Welcome to life, man. Sometimes I read the word and I'm like, wow, 
That was about as much fun as getting a root canal. Probably none of you have ever faced that. You're like, oh, every time. I just love the word of God. It just fills my soul. <laughs> Honestly, there's times that all of us look at it and go, man, that wasn't real. That wasn't a lot. But yet you go back. Why do you go back? Because it's a decision. Because you want to be fed. You want your spirit to be fed. You know what I find interesting? Kids hear more than you think they do. I mean, you could stand right in front of your kids and be yelling, Stop doing that! And they, in their eyes, you're not even there. You're like a pigment of their imagination. You're not even there. But, if you're in the car, and you blow your horn at somebody and go, you idiot. Little Johnny or little Susie, one day when you're home, you say something to go, and they look at you and go, you idiot. <laughs> you're like, where'd they hear that from? You've been with your father for too long. And then little Johnny or Susie goes, no, Mom, I heard it from you when you blew the horn at that idiot in front of you. It said, drive your car! It's interesting that we hear more than we think we do. And even if that word of God's really not doing anything at the moment, that might be being tucked away in a corner of your heart. For it to be pulled up at a later time. And all of a sudden, did it ever happen to you? All of a sudden, you're like, you face a situation and something comes to your mind and your heart. And you're like, where did that come from? Like you're encouraged? It's because the word of God has been implanted into your life. And the Bible says that it will never return void. It's there for a reason. And what the devil wants us to do is he wants us to so doubt the change that Christ has done in our life so that we just keep looking at the doubt instead of we look at the faith that we have in Christ Jesus. I have over 40 some years at times doubted my relationship with Jesus Christ. I have doubted am I truly saved. And I've, I've, I've doubted did I really accept him. But it, then those hard times come where you're knocked to your knees and the wind is knocked out of you. And all you have and all you can say is Jesus. And those are the moments when I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I know I'm different now. Faith in a new life, according to the Corinthians church, according to Paul, was being squashed by feelings of the old life. Determined faith based on God's word and promise will assure you that you're different. Early in my walk with Christ, there were things that I struggled with. Faith, trusting, a bunch of things. Went to the Rev and I said, yo, Rev, these are some things I'm struggling with. So what Rev told me to do was get some three by five cards and to go through the scripture and write down some scriptures on these three, to, three by five cards and keep them in my truck with me. I was working construction at the time. So right on my seat, I would have my Bible next to me. And inside my Bible was a stack of three by five cards. And I didn't know the word of God that well, so I resorted to the three by five cards. Like, if you said, I need a scripture on trusting. Oh, I don't know where to go. It's in the Bible. Well, I'd look there, and on the top corner, I had right, trusting. I'd flip through it, and I'd... There it is. Those who trust in the Lord. Trust. It was right there. I'd read the scripture. Maybe there's something else that I struggled with. And went to there. There it was. And I took it up and I 
I read it, and there it was. And what it started to do was when that doubt would come, I would combat it with the word of God. Uh, when Christ fasted for 40 days in the desert. 40 days. Some of us have a hard time going 40 minutes. We should do a 40-minute fast. How many would be willing to fast for 40 minutes? I mean really fast. No, no cheats. 40 minutes. Okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have to do that. We're going we're gonna to put out a 40-minute fast. I, I think it's somebody remind me of this. This is going to be good. We'll store up. like we'll, we'll get plenty of weeks so we can build up a, you know, a little extra so we can go the full 40 minutes. But he was, 40 days he was in the desert and he fasted. And then the devil came to him. And what did the devil come with? Doubt. Didn't he? I think he came with doubt. Hey, yo, all this could be yours. Just, you know, bow to me. Jesus standing there, 40 days, no food, going, wait a minute, that's yours? I, I thought it was mine. I thought it was my dad's. Wait a minute. Wait. And, what, and, and all three times, all three times, what did Christ do to change that? The word of God. All three times. The devil said this. The doubt came in. Jesus used scripture to cast out all doubt. The devil would love nothing more than to cause you and I to live in the doubt that we are not different. When Jesus Christ wants us to not only know we are now different, but he wants us to live different. And that's what Paul talks about here. And that's what we're going to talk about. And that's what we're going to look at. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I think it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a something that we can really take hold of. I, I want you to be encouraged by this because, look at me, all of us, all of us face that doubt. And it's when you start facing that doubt is when you start to run away from God. It's, it's, this is how we are. There's a guy, I was telling Cher about this the other day, guy at the gym, I've seen him for years, we talk, and you know, he knows who, what I do and stuff, and a couple months ago, he came to me, and he said, hey, listen, you know, do you talk to people, and you know, he has, he's battling a, a form of addiction, and, and he says, you know, I just, I thought I'd talk to you, I said, sure, so, you know, he had my cell phone, I said, let's set up time, we set up a time, that morning, we were supposed to meet that evening I text him you, you, oh, sorry Steve um, something came up I, I, I can't but uh, thanks he said I'm doing better I'm like oh okay so I went away on a missions trip and you know came back so I wasn't at the gym for a couple weeks so he, he's seen me and I'm like something's different so the other day I approached him because normally he'd come right over to me and talk to me as I approached him he had his headphones in he kind of turned like he didn't see me. And he started to give some distance. So I, I followed him. <laughs> I just followed him. I'm too dumb not, not to. I followed him. I tapped him. He turns around. I go, hey, how you doing? And I don't ask him. I, I won't ask him, hey, how's your problem? I haven't talked to him about his problem. But what's interesting is he came to me and wanted help. I was going to help him. But now, he won't come near me. I didn't walk up to him and say, I think you got a problem. Now, I can understand not somebody not wanting to be near somebody. They come up and look at you. But isn't that funny? That's how we do things with God. We look at him and say, yeah, I'm really struggling right now. I'm really having a hard time right now. And you lay it out to God, and then the next thing you know, you're like avoiding him. Like, oh, man, I, I just, I don't think I'm going to go over. Yeah, I'm just going to going to like lay low, do the live stream at church and, you know, hang out at home, my undies and coffee and everything. I don't need to be around. Isn't that what we do? That's, you know, that's doubt. We doubt God can handle it. We doubt that God can change it. We doubt that God can change us. Any of you ever doubt that God could change you? All right, some of you should have really put up your hands right now because when I look at you, I'm like, that was a big one. Okay, seriously? When you really look at it, you really think, I mean, do you ever get to the place where really you can, you can change me? And what's so cool? 
There hasn't been a single person ever created that God can't change. If they want to change. So be encouraged. You know what my prayer is during this series? Is that you want it to be changed. That's going to be our prayer. Lex, put down a prayer list. We pray people want to be changed. Because that's your battle. That's your fight. That's your fight. And like I said, as I follow that guy through the gym, I'm too dumb to stop. There's a whole bunch of dumb people in here. We're too dumb to stop praying. The peace? Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, for your truth, for your hope that we find in you. God, establish or reestablish in every life that's here. If they've accepted you, establish that, that, that post, that, that altar, that, 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 that tent stake of, yes, they are now different. I pray, Lord Jesus, that lives would be encouraged. I pray doubt would be cast away. And I pray, God, that not a single one, I know not a single one, are outside of your grasp. Lord, but I'm sure there are people here this morning that need you. That God, that they need to come to you and surrender their life and begin brand new. I ask, Lord Jesus, that right now, they would be willing to surrender. With your heads bowed for just a moment, we ask this question every week. If there's anybody here this morning that wants to pray to know Christ in their life, you want to start this journey, I want to pray for you. In a minute, I'm going to look across this room, and all I'm going to ask you to do is just look at me. And then I'll lead you in a prayer. My right, you want to pray? Look at me right now. All I got to see is your eyes. My left, all I got to see is your eyes. All right. Why don't we all stand? If you'd like prayer this morning, we got people up.